So let's look at the last two groups of protists, of the four that we're looking at. These are going to be unicellular and multicellular algae. So again, as we look at algae as protists, we've got to realize that sometimes taxonomists don't put the algae into the kingdom protista. Um, sometimes they're studied with kingdom plantae. As we'll see that there are certain protists, specifically the phylum Chlorophyta, um, from which we think all land plants arose. So it, it makes logic, logical sense both ways. Um, but for now we're going to call them protists, and we're going to look at two major groups. Unicellular, we're going to look at three groups, dinoflagellates, phylum Pyrophyta, the diatoms, phylum Chrysophyta, and the green single-celled algae, phylum Chlorophyta. As we move into multicellular algae, what we think of as seaweeds in everyday terminology, we're going to focus on the phylum Chlorophyta because the phylum Chlorophyta, as a taxonomic group, actually spans both of these groups. We have single-celled versions, we have filamentous versions, and then ultimately multicellular versions. And that's going to be our progression from this kind of single-celled organism into the multicellular land plants, which we'll study next in Kingdom Plantae. So the first group then are the dinoflagellates, and they're characterized by their dual flagella. So they oftentimes have this kind of equatorial groove in which is one flagellum and a second flagella. They are found in marine environments and freshwater environments, and most are photosynthetic. So these are autotrophs now. They're making their own food. The reason we want to pay attention to the dinoflagellates is because they're responsible for the red tides. And the red tides then um, are the result of a proliferation of dinoflagellates, and um, they often have red pigments, so you can, the water turns red because there's so many of them in the water. And they can produce a neurotoxin that actually kills fish and marine life. And then it's dangerous to eat that marine life. Um, it can kill you. So the dinoflagellates, again, phylum pyrophyta. Um, the diatoms, then, are another group that we're looking at. These are unicellular algae. They are photosynthetic. The interesting thing about the diatoms is that their cell wall is not composed of cellulose. Rather, it's composed of silica. And silica literally is glass. So when you look at these under the microscope, you see literally these beautiful, almost ornamental glass sculptures, right? And literally, they're fit, they oftentimes fit together like a petri dish, where you have a top and a bottom half, and they, they close together like a lid on a box. And the living cytoplasm is inside that, secreting this um, glass house in which it lives. Now, the interesting thing about the phylum Chrysophyta, the diatoms, is that they're the source of what's called diatomaceous earth. So again, if we think about the vastness of the oceans, they cover 70-75% of the planet, um, and that's a lot of photosynthetic uh, real estate. A lot of light coming down in those top several meters of the ocean. And so there's a proliferation of a lot of photosynthetic organisms. Well, as the diatoms proliferate and then die, these glass shells, these glass cell walls, settle down to the bottom of the ocean. And so what you want to think of, there's so much of this stuff, it's kind of raining down um, dead material down to the bottom of the ocean, and it builds up down there. And so there are many places on the land that used to be under ocean, and you can actually dig up what is called diatomaceous earth. It's earth rich in the remnants of these glass cell walls. And if you go home and look at your cleaning uh, agents, you may have one that's abrasive, an abrasive cleaning agent, and one of the ingredients will be diatomaceous earth. And that's because this is a very, very great polishing agent. These tiny little pieces of glass then can be used as a polishing agent and as an abrasive cleanser. And we literally just mine this out of the earth from the seas that used to be from these photosynthetic organisms. Right? So we have the dinoflagellates, the diatoms, and then we want to think about the green algae. And the green algae is going to be our segue into the land plants. Because all the land plants have very, very similar basic photosynthetic pigments, and they're the, fig the pigments based on chlorophyll. And this is where we see those same pigments. So the green algae chlorophyta um, all have chlorophyll. And they have the same types of chlorophyll that we see in terrestrial plants. So in this phylum, this taxonomic group, we're going to see both single-celled and multicellular. Though when we talk about kingdom protista, we talk about our groups, we'll put the single-celled algae in one group 
and the multicellular algae in another. Like I said, this is going to be our kind of segue into land plants. It's also our move from being a single-celled organism into a multi-celled example. So an example then in chlorophyta of a single-celled green algae is chlorella. And this, these little green balls, they look like single cells. This is oftentimes the slime that you'll find on a river rock. So if you're walking in a river and you're stepping on a rock and it's all covered with this green slime and you slip and fall, that green slime oftentimes is one of many species, one of those maybe chlorella that's growing there. Okay, it's an algae. Now, spirogyra is an example of a filamentous algae. Again, you would find this in rivers. Um, but instead of being single cells, the cells are now grouping together. And the other thing that's cool about spirogyra, it has this one long spiral, this helix of a chloroplast. Okay? It also happens to be a jazz band called spirogyra. It was a bunch of science guys that formed a jazz band. Um, but moving now from single cell to looking at how these cells stay together, it must be advantageous to them from an evolutionary point of view to form filaments. And ultimately then we go from a filamentous green algae into a colonial organism. And our example of a colonial organism is going to be Volvox. And this is the picture on the left. This looks like a hollow ball of cells. So this has many cells now living together. Um, there isn't a whole lot of uh, distribution of labor. We don't see specialization of cells, but we always see them together in this ball. And the ball literally forms other balls of cells inside and then splits open to release its progeny. Now, that colonial, that colonial format, that grouping of cells together, then can be taken to the next step where you truly have, like a seaweed on the right, a multicellular green algae. And that takes us to our final group um, of multicellular algae. Again, what we think of as seaweeds. Now, there are examples of chlorophyta, green seaweeds, um, green multicellular algae, but there are others, like the kelp forests are brown algae. Um, we see bull algae, bull kelp algae. We see rhodophyta are the red algae. So there are others. Phaophyta is the brown algae. There's all different kinds, but these are all now characterized by being multicellular. But it is believed that the green multicellular algae, for example, laminaria, um, are most closely related to land plants. And so land plants probably evolved from a common ancestor to these organisms. And one of the big things that is very specific about this group is that it has a life cycle that is called an alternation of generations. It's a sporic life cycle. And that life cycle is going to be seen in the land plants as well. And so that's going to be our next step as we study the diversity of life further.